The American Public Health Association is committed to improving public health and achieving equity in health status. This year, we are incredibly excited to welcome all our members back, virtually and in person, to Denver to share the latest in research and public health leadership. This is APHA TV. Hi everyone and welcome to the start of the American Public Health Association's annual meeting. While the in-person activities in Denver are just around the corner, we hope you will take advantage of the on-demand content available today on the meeting platform. Live poster presentations also start on Thursday, so make sure you don't miss out on an opportunity to connect directly with researchers. APHA TV is also starting early, and we are happy to bring you a warm welcome from Executive Director Georges Benjamin, followed by exclusive interviews with Drs. Gail Christopher and Jeanette Cowlick. Health equity is a major focus for the association, and these interviews start our conversations on race and economic health inequities. Dr. Abdul El Sayed also joins APHA TV to tell us about his podcast, America Dissected, and the work that he is doing to better the public's health. Dr. El Sayed is also holding a live recording of America Dissected at the Colorado Convention Center on Sunday, October 24th, so be sure not to miss out on that. And now, over to Dr. Benjamin. Hello. I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin, the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association, and the official kickoff of the APHA 2021 is just a week away. Please mark your calendars for the opening general session, which takes place Sunday, October 24th, from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, which is being live streamed fresh from Denver. However, don't miss the pre-meeting activities, which are starting today. The virtual navigate and network sessions, which are hosted by APHA's membership, which take place Monday, October 18th from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Mountain Time. If you miss this session, it will be recorded. On-demand poster and roundtable presentations are already available for you to view at your leisure. Attend a virtual business meeting or social hour hosted by one of our member groups. And don't miss the live poster sessions on Thursday, October 21st and Friday, October 22nd. These are new for APHA 2021. Both virtual and in-person attendees have full access to this annual meeting platform. Familiarize yourself with the tool, update your profile, and opt in to the attendee list, which will allow you to send messages to other attendees and bill your schedule. Be sure to visit the Networking and Engagement section of the Annual Meeting Platform to find out how to connect with your peers in Denver or those of them that are online. I look forward to welcoming many of you at the Mile High City this Sunday and look forward to participating in all the networking and connecting available to those who are be in person in Denver. And for those participating at home, you have the access to hundreds of sessions and countless networking opportunities. Looking forward to seeing you all in Denver for APHA 2021. Please enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. We now welcome Dr. Gail Christopher, a nationally recognized leader in health policy, to get her thoughts on racial healing through policy. Welcome, Dr. Christopher. It's wonderful to be here. So this year's meeting theme is focused on social connectedness. Can you speak to the importance of racial healing for improving social connectedness? You know, we are, as a country, deeply divided along racial lines. Uh, we have institutionalized segregation. And when we no longer made it a, a government practice, we still didn't address the legacy of it. And one of the ways that we must overcome racism in this country is by building connections across racial lines. You've also pioneered the development and implementation of the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Framework. Can you describe that framework and how it can be used to promote racial healing and improve connectedness? Truth Racial Healing and Transformation is an American adaptation 
of the globally recognized truth and reconciliation process. And so truth, racial healing, and transformation as a framework has five, I like to call them buckets. I know that's a very scientific term, but, uh, and sometimes we call them pillars. Narrative change, racial healing and relationship building, separation, that is overcoming the legacy of separation, transforming our legal system, and transforming our economy to reflect equity and justice. Can you give us some examples of what racial healing looks like in practice? What are some things that communities around the country are doing or can do if they want to promote racial healing and racial equity? Oh, I was just on a call with some, a philanthropic network in Ohio, and they have, have trained a cadre of facilitators of racial healing circles. And so they are opening up this opportunity to people in their communities. And they're amazed at the numbers of people who want to do it. But things like uh, changing the, 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 the monuments, changing the, the public spaces so that they are more inclusive, they're more reflective of a broader community, that all contributes to racial healing for sure. And what advice would you give to public health professionals who are engaged in this work but encounter a lot of resistance? Well, resistance says that you're doing something. So you're always going to encounter resistance if you're trying to make systematic or systemic change. So I would say don't be disheartened by resistance, but rather be, be inspired by it and know that you have to figure out how to, how to work around the resistance and to keep doing what you're doing. And so don't be disheartened by resistance. Know that that's just an indication that you're making progress. Thank you for your time and insights, Dr. Christopher. Enjoy this year's meeting. It's been a pleasure. APHA TV is brought to you from the 2021 APHA Annual Meeting. You can find us in person at the Colorado Convention Center, in select hotels, and on the homepage of the meeting platform, as well as on our YouTube channel and Twitter feed. We are back now with Dr. Jeanette Koalik, who is previewing her session on food and nutrition security. Welcome, Dr. Koalik. Often when we talk about preventing chronic conditions, including obesity, the message gets simplified to eat healthy and exercise. Can you talk about why that message has not yielded a major progress toward reducing obesity rates across all communities? So we know what needs to be done to live a healthy lifestyle and a healthy weight at an individual level. So if it was that simple, we wouldn't have the problem. Uh, just acknowledging that there's policy level issues that continue to impact uh, our public's ability to live their best lives. Uh, even children, for instance, we saw that obesity had risen over the last year uh, across pretty much the country and acknowledging the role of the pandemic and amplifying a lot of inequities that we knew had already existed and just really, really pushed us to um, you know, advocate for those that have been saying all along that we need to be serious about dismantling racism and policy and practices, and that we can no longer wait. We have to make these changes now. And what do we know about what actually works to achieve sustainable long-term changes in the health of marginalized communities, especially communities of color and those who are low income? So we know poverty is a strong predictor of obesity. So we know that there are many inequities tied to how much people make, the types of benefits they have at their jobs, the quality of education that they receive, uh, access to healthy foods. You know, many communities don't have a place where they could get fresh produce, fresh meats, uh, or they have to have a car or some other form of transportation to access those things uh, outside of their neighborhood. So all of those things are huge barriers to uh, being able to live a healthy lifestyle. So if you're uh, specific about addressing policy and eradicating poverty, you would see gains as far as improvement of overall health. And we know that there's inequities tied to poverty related to one's race and gender. So, you know, making sure that we're eliminating disparities in pay, the federal government, you know, calling this out and really calling um, private sector to action is a way to really help uh, eradicate this, to be very specific about uh, doing better with pay. We also know that there's a number of other policy measures that can take place. And this, these things were outlined 
and the Trust for America's Health State of Obesity Report, as well as our Leveraging Policies, our FACTS Report, expanding access to health insurance, including the extension of Medicaid, making healthy school meals free for all students. The other is increasing funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, closing tax loopholes and eliminating business cost deductions related to the advertising of unhealthy food and beverages to children, uh, increasing the price of sugary drinks through an excise tax, and then ensuring that everyone has safe and convenient access to walking and biking trails and that all students have safe routes to walk or bike to school. So investing in infrastructure that isn't reliant on uh, vehicles per se can be a great benefit, but we also know for our rural and frontier communities that it's not necessarily that easy. So we have to be strategic and creative in how do we increase access in a healthy and safe manner. What investments need to be made in public health to support improved health of these communities? One of the things that I continue to recommend is allowing the community to lead the way. Uh, the community knows best, uh, regardless of us being doctors and other clinicians and other uh, public health practitioners, but the community has a pulse off of what's happening or on what's happening in the area, as well as the relationships and the trust that sometimes we lack. And what commitments has the Biden-Harris administration made to addressing food security and healthy communities? So we're very pleased that there has been this uplifting of addressing food security at the global and domestic level. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration has committed more than $10 billion uh, over a variety of years to be able to address food systems abroad and, and um, domestically. Well, we are certainly looking forward to hearing more about this timely issue at your session on Monday the 25th. Thanks again for joining us and for your time today. happy to welcome Dr. Abdul El Sayed, whose America Dissected podcast explores scientific discoveries, trillion dollar policies, and cultural trends that are changing the world. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. El Sayed. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's wonderful to be here. You have been a healthcare provider, professor, health officer in an urban health department. You've run for a political office, and now you host a podcast. Where did you learn the most about public health? Well, I, I'll tell you, I think all of us are, are going through a journey um, and we're always learning more. Uh, I can look at every step of, of, of the path that I've been able to walk and, and, and point to a number of lessons that I've learned. And I think when you take all those things together, the ability to listen, uh, the ability to, to engage with serious empirics, uh, the ability to, 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 to uh, make policy on the ground, uh, and finally, the, the responsibility to tell stories and communicate, um, I find those all to be lessons that are really important. Why did you think it was important to come to Denver to do a live taping of your podcast at the APHA annual meeting? You know, we know that um, our, our podcast is uh, is highly listened to by public health folks, and we wanted to bring the podcast uh, to folks and, and have this conversation in uh, the setting of the APHA annual conference because, um, you know, the people we'll be speaking with and, uh, and speaking to um, in the live taping are people who are doing this work every day. I also think that right now, the opportunity to come back together, uh, to engage with one another, to have those interstitial conversations that make a, a, a meeting what it really is, uh, I think was really important. So we're really looking forward to the show. Now, as a former political candidate, what do you wish public health professionals knew about the political system and what advice would you give them on how to engage as advocates or candidates? Uh, one of the, the, the most important aspects of public health, particularly in this moment, is the recognition that we have to be fighters for equity. And there are people who don't believe in that concept. And um, we have to stand up, proclaim our values uh, loudly um, and fight for them and, and do so calmly knowing that we are fighting for people uh, for, 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 uh, against whom um, the, you know, the world has often uh, denied uh, a set of uh, resources. Dr. El Sayed, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.
And that's all for our special pre-meeting episode of APHA TV. We return on Sunday, October 24th from the Colorado Convention Center with many special guests, including CDC Director Rochelle Walensky. Thanks again for joining us and we can't wait to see you on Sunday. Mm -hmm.